tonight is a very special night. It's a Calvary Hospital webinar night update. We will be hearing uh, from two wonderful guests very shortly, Father Tony Percy, and we'll also be hearing from Honourable Kevin Andrews about strategy for the Senate submission to speak up for Calvary Hospital, to, to have a voice for Calvary Hospital in the federal parliament and with our federal parliamentarians, which will have a trickle-down effect into the ACT, we believe. But before we go any further, I'm going to ask my dear brother, James Dargan, I think you found a bone down there in Canberra, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> that could be your land, you think. Right, that's it. And they're trying to say it belongs to the government. Come on, you would have better pray it back. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, the kingdom of God is at hand. Abba Father, Yeshua, Holy Spirit. Father God, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, Lord, we ask that your will be done over Calvary, Lord. They're over there. I know they're trying to over your will, but Lord, you're more powerful than any, Lord. You stand on the throne. They do not stand on the throne. They've got to bow to you, Lord. And so, Lord, we ask that, that you know, your will be done over Calvary, Lord, over Calvary Hospital. This is, you know, special hospital, Lord. You know, you know, the Catholics have been, you know, establishing this hospital in your name, Lord, and they've been doing everything by by your will, Lord. And then the government's coming in to, to, to come against not only the Catholics church over this Calvary hospital, but they got, they're coming against your will, Lord. Lord, we ask, Lord, that you will take over and you will stop this and you will reclaim Calvary Hospital in the kingdom of God, Lord, because, Lord, the government, you know, they don't overrule, you overrule. You overrule everybody in this nation, everybody on on on, on, on in this in, in on this land, Lord. And we Lord, we ask, Lord, that that this will this outcome of Calvary Hospital will go back to your will. Your, you have established this in the name of Jesus, by the name of Yeshua, Lord, and I believe and look up. I'm going to prophesy that tonight, that the Lord will reclaim Calvary Hospital for Canberra and for the people of this nation in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. And thank you, Pastor James Dargan, a very good friend of mine here. And we're going to be hearing a bit about a cross that cannot be taken back a bit later on in a second. But first, we've got a special message from Pastor Barbara Miller, who is coming to Canberra at the end of July to have a conference, and she will be and her team will be praying uh, for Calvary Hospital. And she's got a prayer and a message for us. And she's talking about her conference, but she's also talking about the fact that we need to keep on praying and not give up on Calvary Hospital. Hi, Canberra Declaration Prayer Warriors. Keep praying. Keep pressing in. We have the charge of the light horsemen in our nation and we need to charge ahead for all that God has called us into the destiny of Australia as a Christian nation. So onward, Christian soldiers, for that purpose. So sorry that Norman and I can't be with you tonight, uh, but we have an exciting event in Cairns where the Israeli ambassador to Australia will be meeting with Christians and Jews at a Christian venue and leaders of ministries in Australia that support Israel will be speaking. And um, my husband, Norman Miller, will be speaking on Indigenous Friends in Israel. So it's then we go to Townsville and do the same thing there tomorrow night. So I just wanted to let you know that registrations are flowing in for our conference in Canberra called Church and Cultural Challenges. That's on the 27th to the 29th of July. So we invite you warmly to be there. It's going to be a very strategic time in the spirit uh, in our nation to shift this nation to God's plans and purposes for this nation. So don't miss out. We would love to see you there. And I just want to say, don't give up on Calvary Hospital in Canberra. A Canberra intercessor told me that she had a vision 
of two very large angels landing strongly on each side of the door of Calvary Hospital in Canberra, so much so that there was an earthquake and then they made a very, very loud sound. And so we believe that the Lord is uh, on this case. We don't fully know his plans and purposes, but we know that Haggai 2 tells us that God will shake the earth and shake out all those things that are not of him, so only those things of him uh, will remain standing. So we are believing right now um, for Calvary Hospital and Hospice to come back into the hands of the Catholic Church, and we are believing also that this will not be a domino situation where... uh, Christian hospitals and schools throughout the nation will be forced into government hands uh, with the domino effect. So we come against that in the name of Jesus and we say thus far and no farther to the enemy and we say, Lord, your will be done. And so we praise your name, Lord Jesus, and thank you, um, Warwick and Kim and all the wonderful prayer warriors at Canberra Declaration Hope to see you in Canberra. God bless you. Amen. So there we go. That is Pastor Barbara Miller and Pastor Norman Miller. And here is a shot of a screen that um, Kim is going to share. It's their uh, conference. It's going to be held down in Canberra. They've got Cindy McGarvey speaking, um, who is a very good friend of the Canberra Declaration, and she's a mighty woman of God, a great publisher, a great writer. Great thinker. Daniel Simon is a solicitor for the HRLA. He'll be talking about the Canberra um, Calvary Hospital situation. Dr. Graham McClellan, who is a he was a founder um, of the Canberra Declaration, along with Bill Muhlenberg. We'll be talking a bit about Bill in a second. Mm. Pastor Peter Walker, a Bunjalung man, who's a dear friend of myself and my wife. Uh, he'll be there. David Jack, who's uh, quite an expert in video, and last but not least, former Senator Amanda Stoker. She's currently um, a uh, key leader uh, in the in in, uh, in 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 Australia, a key spokesman. She's on Sky News, and she'll be there. And encourage you to think about going 27th to 29th. All that information is in the latest email, and Kim will post a link, I believe, in the chat. So we'll move on from that, if it's okay, Kim. Thank you so much. So we are very privileged to um, to actually have uh, Father Tony Percy with us tonight. Uh, I was going to play a song, but I think we should move along. We had some extra prayers there, which are very powerful, and I think uh, that's all good. So let's just go straight into this situation. So Tony, I've known Father Tony for almost a decade now, and he is a priest. He was the uh, Vicar General of the Archdiocese in uh, Canberra, Goulburn, uh, working under uh, Archbishop Christopher Prowse, who was also a good friend of mine. And he has been observing this from the very beginning. Uh, How did it start? Let's give a bit of background to this because there's some people here that might not know what's happened, how it's happened, and then bring us up to speed to date. And by the way, Father Tony Percy is taking time out of a, 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 a... a week retreat with a vow of silence. Now, I don't know how he's got abstination to come and share with us tonight, but obviously he feels this is something he cannot be silent about, but he should be just sitting there praying, reading the scriptures. I'm going to ask him about a scripture he's been reading a bit later on as well. But over to you, Father Father Tony Percy. God bless you. Yeah. Well, well thanks for the call, Warwick. And I, I, I was on a, supposed to be on a silent retreat, but I answered your call when I saw your name, so that, that's why I'm here. I'm delighted to be here, and I'm delighted the, of the sentiments of your wonderful group of people. Uh, so Calvary Hospital came to Canberra in 1979. There were discussions in 1971, and it got a 110-year lease. The government said they wanted to build a new hospital in the north. They said, OK, we'll have a look at the land we've got. Everything went quiet in November last year, and then suddenly, lo and behold, the government came out in uh, April this year saying, well, It'll be, uh, sorry, sorry, May this year, and by the 3rd of July, which has just passed, we are going to compulsorily acquire the hospital. 
In doing that, the government said, well, we don't need to have uh, the standing orders. You don't need to have two months of discussion. We'll just get this uh, through. And secondly, we will do the compulsory acquisition not on just terms. We will do it not according to our Land Acquisition Act of 1994. We'll just simply get this legislation through. It was challenged in the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court rejected it. And so the government took the hospital over on the 3rd of July, just a few days ago, or well, yesterday or the day before. So that's the story. It's um, completely barbaric. It's against all principles of a free and fair society. We have garnered enormous support from around the country and also in the ACT. And I've been telling people this is just the beginning, not the end, because we are now going to go right around the Legislative Assembly in every state of Australia and in the federal jurisdiction as well and ask all the parliamentary if they can give us a guarantee that what has happened here in the ACT will not happen in their electorate. So the fight is on. The ACT government may think it's over, but I'm telling you now, it's just, it's just beginning. So that's the story there, Warwick. It's very sad. As I said to you today, the word Calvary evokes enormous images in a Christian suffering, the suffering of Christ. But, of course, Calvary also evokes the, uh, the great sense of redemption. So this is just the beginning. We've got to see that as a, as a fundamental rule of, of Christians, the providence of God. Okay, we've lost the first round, but we're not going to lose every round here. We won't lose the fight. Can you just explain to us what this picture here is on the screen is, um, uh, Father, Father Tony, uh, what's actually happening here? This happened, I think, on Sunday, just Sunday, just gone. Yeah. Well, Calvary decided to take down the crosses both internally and externally, so that the government wouldn't have the pleasure of trashing the crosses. So we took down the crosses ourselves so that they could be treasured and kept and then used for another purpose. So that's what's happening there on Sunday morning early. I think it was about 8 o'clock on Sunday morning. And just tell us, some of the staff, they've been broken hearted, haven't they? You want to tell us the story about the, the man who, who kissed the crucifix and was just so, I was crying when I heard that story. Yes, that's available. We can get that out to your people. Um, that was a text message which was received and it was quite moving, actually, about this fellow saying, well, look, you know, we see the cross in our daily life, but there are moments when we realise what the cross is. And, and it basically the, we're sort of highlighting the sympathy that God has with us in suffering. We, we're all weak and vulnerable and are broken in lots of ways. And by looking at Christ on the cross and listening to the, the the narratives of those Gospels from Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, we get a sense of how God doesn't abandon us in our own suffering and vulnerability and weakness. And that's what the cross is. And when you take the cross down out of public life or private life, an enormous amount is lost, an incredible amount is lost because you, people no longer feel the sympathy that God has with them. And that's why it made it got tears in my eyes, Warwick. Mm. And is in yours, you know, we're men of faith, and that's why it's, the cross is so important. Yeah. Just before I came down uh, here to, to this, uh, to my office to do this call, Father Tony, I was just chatting with my daughter in law, and my daughter in law is from Wagga Wagga, and there's a Calvary hospital in Wagga Wagga. And I told her Correct. what she's doing tonight, and uh, she said her sister, who's not a person of faith, right? But she's a nurse, and she said that the difference between the public hospital system and the Catholic hospital system is chalk and cheese. And this is not a Christian speaking. She said she loved uh, being a, a trainee in Calvary Hospital because the nurses cared. There was a Christian ethos. Now, this is a non-Christian woman speaking, and she's since moved closer and closer to Christ, which is good news, but she's not there yet. Just pray for her total salvation. Her name is Beck. But she shared with my uh, daughter-in-law, Katie, Katie Marsh, that the, the care in a Christian and especially a Catholic Calvary hospital, which there's several of them across the nation, is far higher and far better. And for, a lot of people don't understand, Brother Tony, that hospitals did not exist before Christ. It was Christians and very much the early uh, Catholic Church and leaders within the Catholic Church and sisters and brothers who started the first hospitals. It's important for people to realise that. A lot, some people might know that, Tony. You want to 
share for one or two minutes about that? Well, look, I think that's right. I mean, I, I would recommend that your viewers and people read a book by a guy called Rodney Stark called The Rise of Christianity, which analyzes the rise of the Christian faith in the first three centuries. And one of the reasons the Christian faith rose so quickly was because of our love for those that are, that are sick and poor. And this, this has always been a mark of, of Christianity right from the get-go, that we, we take particular care of those that are vulnerable. So the, the motivations of a private Catholic slash Christian hospital, like the seven-day Adventists have a cracker hospital there in Sydney. I just forget what it's called now. It's called the... Um, I bet Warringah. Yeah, it's a great hospital, very well renowned, and th- these th- the motivations are very clear, and that's why they people have never objected to the medical care that they get in these hospitals or the pastoral care, and and we know that these hospitals do not shove religion down people's throat, but they invite people, as was the way of Christ, and that's why they're so good because they're motivated by another ulterior motive, which is spiritual. So, I mean, we all know in Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians 5, that the human person is defined as body, soul, and spirit. And that's what a Christian hospital tries to do. It tries to look after the needs of the body, the soul, and the spirit. And that's the demarcation point. That's the demarcation line. It's it's a very important idea. Amen and amen. And thank you for sharing that. And that book, by the way, is a very good book by Rodney Stark. And I think there's a link might be in the chat to that. Kim, I'm going to, I've sent you a link to the actual form and we'll go through that in a second. I sent it just before the time, but um, we'll do a demonstration of that with um, uh, Kevin. But there's something else I'd like you to share, um, my dear brother, uh, if you were. We, both of us understand that there's great power in the cross. And this, to me, I'm, gr- I'm, I'm deeply grieved by what's happened in Canberra. To me, this is the most insidious thing because not only are we killing babies, right, that the government's allowed us to kill or allowing and and basically encouraging hospitals and doctors to kill babies and now to kill old people, euthanasia, uh, but they're going to steal a hospital which has been sacred, a, a place that's been protected, uh, and it's, it's a sacred space, and they're going to turn it into a slaughterhouse for little babies and for old people. They've got, they've got their hands on that hosp- hospice down there now, and who knows how many old people are going to be killed because of this, what's happened here. And uh, any comments about the sadness that you and I bear about this, this matter uh, uh, as before we go to uh, Kevin? So, do you want me to respond to that, uh, Warwick? Yes, would you respond? Yeah. Okay, so Claire Holland House is the, is the institution very revered in Canberra that looks after palliative care needs, end-of-life issues, very revered. And <clears throat> this is very important to, that we care for people that are in, in great need. Now, the ACT government now has the power to put in these VAD laws, voluntary assisted dying, in other words, euthanasia. And what they're saying, they're floating the idea that we'll make this available for 14-year-olds plus. It's horrific, isn't it? Well, we're the adults and we're supposed to be helping the young ones and this is this is not happening. So we've got real problems as we enter life, and we've got real problems as we exit life. So these these sort of um, these sorts of behaviours by governments should be arousing us, and as they are, not only denominationally but right across the Christian denominations, to say right enough is enough. We've got to do something about this. And I, I personally feel very convicted now that we we've got to really get on our bike and do something more comprehensive than we've done up until this point. And that, that's, a, that's an act of, um, of faith, but it'd be, we need a lot of prayer and we need a lot of courage and we need, we need a lot of sympathy within the body of Christ to help each other to do it. And I think we can do it. And I think you're right, my dear brother. I think you're right. Now, you haven't seen Kevin, um, Ke- Kevin uh, Andrews for how long now is it uh, since you've Last caught up with him. You better say hello to him now. Introduce him, uh, Father Percy. I could introduce him as the uh, oh. longest serving member of Parliament, 31 years. I can introduce him as a former member, a minister uh, in both the Howard government and also the Abbott government. I can introduce to him as a man of faith, but you can introduce him in a far beautiful, more deeper way as you've known him far longer than me. Is that right? 
Well, I've known Kevin. I'm delighted Kevin's with you. And then as I introduce you, Kevin, I'm going to go back on retreat. But I, I look, I just, I'll just i introduce Kevin by saying something that we both did uh, just before George Cardinal George Pell was transferred from the Melbourne jail down to the Barwon jail before the High Court hearing, which was exonerated completely and utterly by the High Court in a 7-0 decision. And that, that is a symbol of what's happening in Australia, what happened to George Pell. Kevin, I said to Kevin um, a couple of months before, would you like to go and visit George? He said he would. So we put in a request and George asked to see us both. We had, uh, I think, about 45 to uh, 60 minutes with the Cardinal. It was the most uplifting time for both Kevin and I to talk with the Cardinal in jail. He was very high-spirited extremely joyful, happy, and um, he elevated our spirits. It was the most extraordinary experience, and Kevin and I shared that. And so I salute Kevin. Kevin's a wonderful Christian man, wonderful family man, that's important, and a man of the country. Kevin's got a deep love for Australia, as his wife has and as the children have, so you couldn't get a better person on your show, to be honest, uh, Warwick. I'm delighted that you've asked him to come on. And I would agree with you 100%. And uh, Kevin, uh, it's just a great honour that you could be on. And it's uh, just let me say one more thing here before we go any further. I met Cardinal Hell uh, with actually with Pastor Peter Morgan. Uh, he 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 allowed myself and Uncle Pastor Peter Morgan, who uh, was a mighty man of God from Darwin, to go and visit him in Sydney. And that man is a godly man, and he was set up. And it's now uh, well known that it was absolutely fabricated and was lies and treachery from the Victorian government because he's a godly man and he's a man that loves Jesus. And that it, was just, it was just a stack of lies and a stack of evil that, uh, that did that. And it's great to know that you guys brought love and care to dear Cardinal at that time. Over to you, Kevin. You want to say hello? Um, thanks very much, Warwick. It's uh, great uh, to be with you and all the participants uh, tonight. And I uh, can also say uh, thank you to Tony for... Um, his words, but more so for the work which he's doing leading this fight against the ACT government in relation not just to Calvary but to the much broader issues. And that's really where I'd like to start because this is an unprecedented assault on religion and it's an unprecedented assault on property in Australia. But the fact that a government can just arbitrarily, as they have done, a change of law in the ACT to acquire a property which is the subject of an ongoing lease, I think, for another 70 or 80 years or so, in which they've uh, put you know, funds and finances into and built a wonderful community facility, of which there's no objection or has been about the way in which it's been conducted or the financial management of the Calvary Hospital uh, in the ACT, one of a number of hospitals which uh, the Calvary organisation uh, are, are conducting right around Australia. So there's no justification. The reasons given by the ACT government were the most flimsy reasons I could think of. We want to somehow coordinate healthcare and hospital services in the ACT. Well, every other state and territory in Australia manages to successfully coordinate health and hospital services, which are conducted by both government hospitals and by private hospitals, uh, including religious hospitals. So uh, this is a nonsense excuse from the ACT government as to why they did it, and it's one that we must continue to oppose. We must oppose it because of uh, what happened in relation to Calvary, but we also must oppose it because of the greater principle involved. If the ACT government can simply walk in and uh, acquire a hospital in this regard, then they can acquire any other property in the ACT. There's no reason that they could not acquire, for example, a, a Christian school in the ACT because it's in exactly the same situation so far as the property is concerned. Well, there's no reason why they could not acquire uh, the land upon which uh, there are buildings which conduct Christian organisations or Christian uh, operations, uh, whether it's a you know a Christian radio station or it's a a, a Christian organisation which advocates 
uh, for Christian principles or even a Christian charitable organisation, uh, it's the same principle which applies. If Calvary Hospital can be acquired in this way, uh, as Father Tony said, without any just terms, uh, then this can happen to any other Christian and indeed any organisation or any piece of property in the ACT. And that's why I say this is a radical manoeuvre by the ACT government and one, one which we must oppose, not just because of Calvary, but because of the fundamental principles involved. And we don't want to see this happening any further, either in the ACT or elsewhere. Uh, the ACT is probably the most radical left-wing government uh, in Australia, uh, but there are some that are not far behind. I think the state in which I am in at the present time uh, to the south, namely Victoria, has a relatively you know, radical left-wing government as well. And if this happens once, well, then they can be nurtured by being able to be successful in what they do, and that will then leave it open to other governments perhaps thinking that they can do the same thing. Uh, the other thing is that you know, if you look at what's happening in the ACT, this can't be isolated from what Father Tony spoke about in terms of abortion and euthanasia. The proposals for euthanasia in the ACT are the most far-reaching radical proposals that had been advanced anywhere in Australia and indeed pretty much anywhere in the world. The idea that a 14-year-old can ask and be given euthanasia simply shows that somehow society has lost its way. I mean, we spend millions of dollars and huge efforts each year, rightly so, to try and prevent youth suicide. And yet, on the other hand, you have the ACT government proposing that we'll be able to say to 14 and 15-year-olds, well, if you want assistance to kill yourself, well, then we'll allow that to happen. Uh, th this, is, this, is, this is total madness in terms of any uh, way forward in terms of the preservation of the dignity and the liberty of individuals and to extend it to young people uh, who at a stage uh, don't really know their own minds. We know that the brain is still developing at that age. Uh, for that to allow, be allowed to happen uh, would be something which I think even many proponents of euthanasia generally would find horrific and, uh, and a step too far. And then there's talk about even extending it to people who have dementia. In other words, people who don't really know what's been happening. Uh, when, I, when I moved the Commonwealth legislation in 1996 to overturn effectively the ability of the territories, in particular the Northern Territory, but also the ACT, to be able to enact laws like this, we were told that this is all just a slippery slope, that it won't happen. Yet what we've seen in states where they've been able to do it, and now in the ACT, and presumably this will follow in the Northern Territory, where they now, once that Commonwealth Act had been overturned, uh, then to, to take a much more radical turn than even we've seen in the various states in Australia. So this is a very real fight about life, about Christian principles, but also about principles that have underpinned the Australian way of life uh, from the very outset, and namely the right to property and the right not to have your property acquired by the state. Over the centuries, we've seen property acquired, we've seen church property acquired. Usually this has occurred in totalitarian systems. To have it occur in a democratic system such as Australia and in the ACT is therefore truly shocking and we need to do all we can to continue that fight. So I commend Warwick and all of you who are involved in uh, this campaign to continue the fight, uh, even though it may seem very difficult uh, from time to time. In particular, can I commend to you the bill which uh, my friend Senator Matt Canavan has moved in the Senate. This is a very simple bill. All it requires, uh, and because the Commonwealth uh, can effectively override the territory or can give directions or put uh, uh, guardrails about territory legislation, for example, then effectively what this bill does is require the ACT government can, to conduct a full inquiry into this bill which it introduced to acquire Calvary. Now, that's important because, as I said earlier, the reasons that have been given are so flimsy. 
the government hasn't come forward and told the people of the ACT or indeed the people of Australia why they're really doing this. And it doesn't, it's not an inquiry by the Commonwealth government. It's not an inquiry by anybody else other than the ACT itself, but it would require a proper inquiry and it would allow submissions from people uh, about what has happened in the ACT to occur and it would allow proper questioning of what's happened in the ACT. So this bill has been referred to the uh, Senate Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee. Uh, submissions for that inquiry close on the 17th of July, so that's just the week after next, and the committee is due to report back on Senator Canavan's bill on the 9th of August in time for the federal parliament uh, when it comes back for the next sitting session in Canberra. So I'm sure Warwick will be able to um, explain uh, how you can make a submission, but you can simply do by uh, sending an email to the Senate Legal and Constitutional Committee. I'm sure Warwick will circulate the details, but if you want to take it down, the, the email is legcon, L-E-G-C-O-N, dot sen, S-E-N, at aph.gov.au. But I'm sure that will be circulated to you uh, either during the continuation of uh, this meeting uh, or or later. And uh, an inquiry can be quite, uh, I should, should say a submission, can be quite simple, simply supporting uh, the legislation, uh, saying that, you know, you're appalled by what's happened uh, in the ACT by the unfair way and the arbitrary way uh, in which the ACT government has acted without any sort of public scrutiny or public inquiry and, and in encouraging uh, the committee to recommend that Senator Canavan's bill be passed by the Senate and encouraging senators to vote uh, to pass his bill when it comes back into the Senate. Uh, if you do that, and I would suggest also sending uh, similar letters or similar emails to the senators in your state or territory uh, from uh, all parties that are represented uh, in the Senate from your state or territory, again, a very simple letter or a simple email will indicate to them that there is widespread disapproval of what's happened in the ACT uh, and that you want to see a proper inquiry being undertaken. Uh, Warwick, I might stop there. I'm happy to uh, answer questions, but you may have more in terms of uh, your uh, the, the, what you might circulate in terms of encouraging people to make submissions. Yeah, look, um, just to quickly explain and hang around uh, if you're able to, Kevin, because we will have some questions. Um, but what we've created, um, we've actually created a very simple system. You don't have to remember that email address, number one. You just have to wait for our email tomorrow and we will send a link to you. So you'll get one link, you click that link, and we've prepared 10 possible submissions. And I'm going to, in a second, also get my uh, Kim Parnak to actually show how simple this is. But the key thing with these submissions is to try to make them your own. All you have to do is change the first sentence and possibly the last sentence and make it very much your own submission. So, I mean, you can add 10 words, you can add 100 words, you can add 1,000 words to these submissions, but essentially you can make it your own. And so you'll get this link. Uh, it's not live right this very second, but it will be live when we send the email out tomorrow. And it, here it goes. You'll come up to this page, take action, call for an inquiry to the acquisition of Calvary Hospital. Click the blue button and follow the prompts to send a submission to call for an inquiry into the acquisition of Calvary Hospital. It will only take a few minutes. Uh, the wording has been provided, but feel free to adjust as you see fit. Be concise and respectful, so please don't swear and uh, say rude things. I Probably some of you feel like saying those rude things, but do not do that. I repeat, do not do that. Be respectful. Please, you have to identify yourself. And in this case, because we're going to send this to the Prime Minister, uh, we're going to send it to uh, the, the committee. It'll go to the actual committee with the inquiry. It'll be your submission to the inquiry, number one. Number two, it will go to the Prime Minister that is uh, Anthony Albanese, who is supporting this horrific tragedy, this horrific injustice. He's actually come out publicly and said he's going to support it. So he needs to hear from you. And the best way you can uh, do that is actually by sending this uh, your submission to the Senate inquiry to him. And yes, it'll go to your local federal member 
and it will go to all 12 members in the Senate. Now, this is where I've just got to ask your advice, Kevin. Because the Greens actually voted, which is most unusual, thank God they did, they voted that this, this, uh, this inquiry into the Senate would go ahead. We'll come back to that in a second, by the way, Kim. Uh, Kevin, it strikes me we should send it to the Greens, but what are your thoughts? I, I agree, uh, Warwick. Um, I think it should go uh, you know, effectively to all senators uh, because if this bill comes on for a vote in the Senate, which is what we would all hope, uh, we would hope that sufficient senators would vote for it so that uh, it would have a chance of being enacted. If it passes the Senate, then obviously it needs to go to the House and pass the House as well. But the fact that if we can get it through the Senate would provide momentum uh, in an endeavour to get it through the House as well. So I, I support it going to uh, the Greens. Uh, it's, it's not asking for anything unreasonable or outrageous. It's simply asking for what the ACT should have done in the first place and had an inquiry into the acquisition. Yeah, let's just talk about that for a second because normally there would have been an inquiry, wouldn't there, Kevin? There, there's a normal procedure to have a public inquiry about such a large acquisition. It's probably worth a billion dollars. Who knows what it's worth? And so they've actually completely disregarded all due process. You want to explain that? It's quite horrific, isn't it? That, that's true. Um, for an acquisition like this, you would expect an inquiry. For most uh, pieces of legislation or bills in the parliament, uh, you expect an inquiry uh, into it so that people can have and input into it. And governments can be asked questions as to why they're proposing to take a particular course of action. All of that's being ignored or has been ignored in the ACT. And that's why I say there is nothing unreasonable or outrageous uh, or untoward about asking the ACT government to effectively do what they should have done in the first place. 100%. Now, one other thing, I know you, you've touched on it quite, you've been quite uh, comprehensive in your um, in your sort of, uh, shall we say, your uh, analysis, but a lot of people don't understand this. They don't get that this is a precedent. It goes into law and it becomes a law, if you like, or a precedent of law in the ACT. And everyone says, well, I don't live in the ACT. It's a bit like uh, Martin uh, Neumuller who said, uh, you know, they first they came for the communists and the, and the unionists, and I wasn't a communist and unionist, and I didn't speak up. And then they came for the gypsies, and I wasn't a gypsy, and they didn't speak up. And then they came uh, for the Catholics, and I wasn't a Catholic, and I didn't speak up. And then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak up. The reality is, is that this is a precedent, and a national precedent. Yes, it occurs in the ACT, but it's got a national effect and it could literally uh, cascade right across the states. And as you pointed out, it's not just Christian property, it's any property. Any property can be, if, if one property can be confiscated, any property can be confiscated. Any comment from you? Well, um, having, having done it once, um, the ACT in particular may well be emboldened to do it again. Uh, I noticed just recently a news report in the last couple of days where Apparently, uh, a Christian message on a bus uh, in the ACT has been ordered to re be removed. So this is once again the ACT interfering with what essentially is not just religious freedom but all sorts of other rights as well. And once, once they get away with something like this, history shows that uh, these sorts of governments are emboldened to try again. And if this happens successfully in the ACT, then uh, you know another radical left-wing government elsewhere in Australia may well say, oh, well, they've got away with it in the ACT. Uh, we can do it in our state. So that's why we're, we're this, this is not just a fight. It's an important fight about Calvary, but it's not just about Calvary. It's about the very principle of um, religious organisations being able to operate uh, services freely without interference by the government and particularly without being acquired by the government in the way in which the ACT has done so. So it's it's a precedent, not, not in the sort of strict legal sense in a court of law, but it's, it's a political precedent uh, which, as I say, if allowed to occur 
well, then other governments may well be emboldened to try the same thing. 100%, 100%. So we're going to go back to this document, Kim, if we can. And uh, I want uh, Kevin to comment on the process because you can actually do a trial. It doesn't go anywhere right now because it's not live, Kim, if you can pull it up. And um, what happens is that it, this document, it, it, all the salutations are done for you. So you have, all you've got to worry about so you want to put your name in, Kim, uh, in the title. Just click that little button there on the right-hand side. Um, yeah, that's it. And it, it's not live just yet, but you put your you put your address in. You've got to have the address because they've got to know that you actually. And just for the record, uh, Kim is now living in. Um, He's not living. He's, he's not actually living in his own home. So this is this is where it gets a bit interesting for uh, for Kim's sake. But he's putting his address in now. If you want your um, your um, uh, email to go and this email to go to the prime minister, we have to have a phone number. So this is not about uh, selling people's information. This is the reality is that because this goes to a page and the prime minister requires a phone number. So if you want it to go to the Prime Minister, so you want to click this now and we'll go to the actual um, where it got. To. So this is your submission. Now, there's 10 of these, but the key thing, and I'm going to get Kevin to explain why, uh, the key thing is to try to make this your own. Now, you can just send it like this and it'll, it's all over Red Rover. You click the blue button and forget it. But if you can make this your own submission, so what you could do is introduce yourself where it says it is outrageous. You want to type in a little bit about yourself, Kim, so that people can get a, an idea of how to, um, yeah, um, you, you change a few words and, uh, you know, you, now Kim is changing the end of the actual submission. You can see it in front of you. He's actually changing the end. It's The easier thing to do is that um, you, you change the beginning and the end. There's an old saying in rock and roll, my background is in music, uh, People remember where, how you start and they remember how you finish and they forget everything that happens in between. So Kim has just changed the end and now he's going to change the very beginning. Uh, he's going to get his spelling right. I'm appalled, not appapulated, appalled. <laughs> oh, we feel terrible, Kim. I know what it's like when everyone looks at you. Um, but if you can make put a sentence about about, you know, who you are, though, Kim, and just maybe do an introduction about yourself as someone who's uh, you've been in the armed forces. You, um, you know, of the of the ABM Australian is it Australian DM? What's that, Kim? F. ADF. That's it. Got gotcha. Australian Defence Forces. Uh, you know. And so if you can put a little bit about yourself, um, you know, uh, you know, and now Kim's getting a bit humorous, all around good Aussie bloke. But seriously, you can put anything you want in there, right? And and just create a story that's going to actually um, you know, make it different. Make the make this so that this is your submission. So you can create a little bit of a story, you can that could go on for um 200 words, 300 words, you could just do one sentence. And he's changed the word uh, from before. I think it was outraged. I forget what it was, Kim. Can you remember? You have to unmute. You have to unmute and tell us. Yeah, no, it just said appalled, and I said and outraged. I'm appalled and outraged. So, so Kim has basically got this submission, which is a standard submission, one of 10 that goes out there, and he's made it so that it's a unique. It's it's totally his submission because he's changed the front, changed the the back end. It's his address there, and the people want to know that it's his address and it's unique. Any comments from yourself, Kevin, about this process? Uh, yes, uh, Warwick. It's it's important that you try and um, individualise it as much as possible. Otherwise, uh, the the recipients will just say, "Oh, this is just a standard form letter that somebody's generated." And you know everybody's just ticked a box to send. So by changing it around, and you know you can leave a paragraph out if you need or whatever, but changing it around makes it uh, an individualised submission from you, uh, rather than allowing people simply to say, "Oh, you know, this is just another one of a computer-generated submission 
uh, which people just had to tick a box kind of thing in order to send off. So that that's why that's important. Yeah. So you know, Kim's just added this, inspired by um, by uh, Kevin. This sets an untenable legal precedent in this country, and we are not living in Nazi Germany or communist China. And Kim, for you, this is actually quite a a, a statement. Can you tell us why? This is so important to you, and you could even, when you do finally do your submission, you might even put a bit about your own history, Kim, because it's quite fascinating, isn't it? Yeah. Um, long story short, my dad was an Austrian. He lived through. Um, he was born in 1914. He lived through uh, Europe and particularly Germany uh, through World War II under the Nazi regime. He uh, operated in the black market basically to survive. He grew tobacco sold that so he could buy flour and make bread and live. Um, he also was an engineer, and in doing so, he had a protected job, so managed to stay out of the army. But Dad and I used to talk when I was probably mid to late teens. I asked Dad about the war and why, what happened with Hitler and how come that came to be. And I, it was just him and me, and we were just talking about it. And he didn't talk about these things very much. But he was very open with me. And things like book burning, uh, the absolute control that you had to do what you were told, that everyone, there was a sense of you couldn't stop it and how that it came in incrementally over time. So as uh, Dad saw the rise of the Nazis, um, uh, saw the rise of the Nazis, he, it, it didn't happen. You know, they didn't suddenly start killing all the Jews and other people. They didn't start there. They started with, everyone needs a job. We're going to look after you. You know, you can't look after yourselves. I mean, the economy is absolutely broken. And we're in the position where the government are breaking the economy, which sets up the situation where people want to be looked after instead of looking after themselves. And freedoms were eroded over time. And it was step by little, step by little, step. And Hitler never got fully elected. He was only a, essentially a minority uh, party, in, in a significant but minority uh, party in the uh, Reichstag, uh, which was, uh, but he managed to wangle his way and become uh, the head of the government there. And because uh, there was so much instability. And he promised jobs, which he really didn't deliver that well. And yeah, we know the story of the VW car, but it actually didn't work out as well as they, you know, the propaganda and the propaganda machine. So all of this, and I, I'm in the process of writing an article on it, so I won't say any more, but it it is happening now. That's a huge statement. It is happening now. And having heard Nell's mum uh, was German and she also lived through the situation and other parts of our extended family were uh, very aware of this. And of course, for our love for Israel, we're just back from the Jerusalem prayer breakfast in Gold Coast and, and that was fantastic. Uh, but what happened to the Jews? That did not happen overnight. And they were, but it wasn't just the Jews. It was Catholics and it was Jehovah's Witnesses, which theologically I obviously disagree with. But they're still people. And Hitler picked on all sorts of minority groups and used the blame game. It's their fault. And that's happening with Christians. We're being blamed for things that are not right. And we have this situation where this, this you know, it's not going to be like that. If we don't do something and get to our knees and pray and take action right now in 10 to 20 years, we will be where Nazi Germany or communist China or Stalinist Russia was, we will be there unless we turn it. And that's a huge call. I mean, that sounds emotive. It sounds incredulous in one sense, except I have seen it and the fruit of it and know firsthand, well, direct from my dad at least, how it happened and others, relatives. and through also the Chinese underground church, as you know, without naming names, my dear Chinese family who are living 
under that regime. It's happening on the planet today at one level or another. We must, we must take action. I'll leave it at that, Warwick. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Kim. And uh, we appreciate uh, appreciate what you're saying. So um, I will go back to Kevin for any last comment he might have. But so you can see that what we we will release this tomorrow. It's better for us to release it on the on the uh, on an email. But what we'd love you to do is to number one pray, and number two send a submission in right and change it. It's so easy to change it and get the spelling right. Just 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 change it and adjust it, and put in your own submission. And if you want to put some extra facts in or some stuff you know about this whole deal or someone's quote, put it in there. Uh, you just Google and cut and paste. It's not hard, okay? But then send this email to three friends with a personal message at the top and say, please, can you also send a submission? It's very easy. Uh, and ask them to do that. And make sure, by the way, if you send it to, you know, 100 people, make sure that you take your unsubscribe thing off the bottom of the email because people will unsubscribe you. It'll take you three months for us to get you back on it because you have to go through a process of getting realigned. So what, that's what I'm suggesting. You just send it to three or four friends with a personal message and maybe a phone call or a text and say, please, can you sign this for Calvary Hospital? Because it's so important. It's not just about us. It's not just about Calvary Hospital. This is about our nation. And I would argue, Kim, with all due respect, that it's not 10 and 20 years. It could be as little as five or 10 years away. Uh, because it's accelerating, it's like a parabolic curve, and as it gets to the bottom of the curve, it gets slip, it gets faster and quicker. But um, Kim, again, thank you for sharing that story, that heart heartfelt story. It's so so important. We're going to ask, I'm going to ask you to pray, Kim, and also maybe Rodney Hall as well uh, from um, from South Australia, and also Betty Harbottle uh, from Victoria, just to pray as we finish tonight. But uh, uh, Kevin, again, thank you, thank you, thank you. And again, thank you to uh, our dear brother, Father Tony Percy. He's had to go back to his silent retreat. He's come out of the silence, his cone of silence, just to be with us tonight. And that was quite a big sacrifice. You've got to understand that they go to these retreats to be quiet and they literally don't say anything for five days. And so Tony, for Father Tony to come and share with us, it just shows you how passionate he is about this issue. And uh, they're having a meeting on Monday, and I'll keep you updated. And the, literally the, the main thing we've got ahead of us, we've got to get as many submissions as we possibly can from as many people as we possibly can before the 17th. Because in some ways, this is only a small glimmer of hope because it, we're only asking for a, an inquiry, as Kevin said. This is just asking for an inquiry by the government that should have made an inquiry in the first place but refused to. Uh, but it allows us to send an email to the Prime Minister. It allows us to email our senators. It allows us to email our local federal member and keep this in the news. And and also we can, over the next two weeks, keep this in the news through media releases and other things because Tony is got, coming back to, after his silent retreat, he's not going to be so silent and he'll be very active. But, Kevin, any last words and advice for us as we... I'll be sending this email out tomorrow. You've seen how it works. It's quite comprehensive. It, it actually sends off a special note, individualised note, to all the different um, uh, senators and also the local member and the prime minister. Anything you'd like to add now that you've seen what we are doing? Uh, 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 Warwick, can I just, just commend you for putting that process in place? Uh, it makes it much more uh, straightforward for people to make uh, effectively numerous submissions all at once. Um, and, and just remember, you can change the whole email if you want to. Yep. You, you could scrub 100%. all the words there because if you want to put it in your own words uh, and entirely differently, don't feel that you are in any way bound to use, you know, any particular part or parts of that email. It's just a way in which it gives you some ideas. But if you, you have something on your heart that you want to say in your own words in a different way, objecting to this and calling for the inquiry, uh, well, then then you can do that um, as well. As I said earlier, uh, the main thing is that you individualise what you do send so it can't be said that this is just some, you know, push a button mass, mass campaign of emails that members of parliament uh, get, get, you know, often enough uh, and it's differentiated from that. But 
uh, can I just again commend you for uh, your effort, commend everybody uh, who's on uh, this Zoom meeting tonight. Uh, it's important that we work together, that we pray for each other uh, and that we continue to trust in uh, God's guidance and God's grace uh, as we go forward. I'll probably leave you now, Warwick, because I've got a in the midst of preparing for a meeting I have to participate in first thing in the morning, but God bless you all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. God bless you, Kevin. Again, thank you, thank you, thank you. We love you. And we're praying for you right now. I'm going to get Kim to pray a prayer of blessing for you and beautiful Margie and the children and all the work you do with Polity. And you might see Kevin. Kevin's now publishing. He's allowed us to publish his articles on the Daily Declaration, and we're getting one or two articles a week from his vast treasure trove of great articles. And that's very kind of you, Kevin, and God bless you. Yeah, Papa God, I just thank you for Kevin and the work that he's done over the years. Uh, servant of Christ, who's also serving as a public servant, as a politician. We bless uh, you, Kevin, and your wife, Margie, and your whole family, and extended family, your church family. Father God, that you would strengthen Kevin in his latter years, that he would remain a strong voice for righteousness in this nation, for truth in this nation, for the gospel in this nation. So we bless you, Kevin, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Good night, all. God bless. Rodney Hall from South Australia. Well, Father, I just thank you, Lord, that you've given each of us an individual fingerprint. And, Father, I just pray, Lord, that people would use their creativity, Lord, to indeed make every submission separate. That's one thing I pray. And the other thing I pray, Lord, is that people would not just do their own submission, but, Father, they would email and, and stir up their whole family, Lord, and friends. Lord, let this be a groundswell. The word viral comes to mind, Lord God. Father, you would cause people to rise up because this is indeed the thin edge of the wedge. And, Father, we need to make a stand right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Betty Harbottle in Wangaratta in northern Victoria. Father God, we come in humility and in brokenness and in repentance that this has been allowed to happen. Father, we forgive this ACT government and we hand it over to you to deal with. Would you deal with these people, Father? But, Father, we want to do our part too. So stir us up, Lord, to to send these submissions to alter them so that they come from us and not not just uh, can be written off, can be um, cast off as, as a one, one of many sent. We pray, Father, that the whole country will rise up and realise that, that the enemy is doing his best to, to control us, to defeat us and to... Um, deny us that freedom that we have in you, Lord Jesus Christ. And so we ask that we will be salt, we will be light, and we will be obedient to you, Lord Jesus, and we will do what you want us to do. Bless these people. Bless the people who work in the Calvary Hospital, Father, and bless uh, the people that have spoken to us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen and amen. And again, thank you. Uh, for coming tonight. We are going to have communion in a second, but we're going to finish the recording side of it. And for those, our Catholic brothers and sisters who can't stay on for communion, we totally understand because for our Catholic brothers and sisters, communion is a very holy thing and it must be done a certain way. And I respect uh, their uh, approach, uh, honour their heart. And again, we just thank God for our Catholic brothers and sisters who might have to leave. But again, thank you for those who've come. We are going to continue with a few more prayers as we finish tonight, but God bless you, and I hope you feel inspired. So please receive this email tomorrow from the Canberra Declaration, uh, but get this email and then put your application in and then send it to three or four friends. You can send it to 10 friends, but I'm asking you to do a special email, a one-sentence email. Dear Joan, please, would you please uh, put a submission in? Speak up before it's too late send a submission in, and then send it to them, individualised, and then do the same. Dear Bill, dear John, dear uh, Uncle Uncle Angus, dear Aunt Mabel, whatever it may be, make those 
personal, and then get on the phone or send some text to people and say, please, I've just sent you an email. Would you please uh, put a submission in because this is important. It's basically, you know, <laughs> this is basically Cuss's last stand in one sense for the hospital. Yes, God could do, still do a miracle to remove the a ACT government, and we're praying that God could do something like that, and God can do something like that. But right now we have something we can do, and that is put in a submission to this inquiry in the Senate. So God bless you, and thank you for joining us, those who do have to leave. And God bless you. 